Hi, greetings and welcome to today's um, PLP Pathways webinar. It is webinar number eight of the year. Um, I want to say a special thank you to the Tarrant Institute and the Middle Grades Collaborative for supporting this project. Um, my name is Maura Kelly. I'm a seventh and eighth grade humanities teacher at People's Academy Middle Level. And I'm joining uh, via audio only today, uh, just a little bit of a tech glitch. My name is Don Taylor, and I teach language arts and middle, uh, and sorry, social studies at Main Street Middle School in Montpelier. Um, hi, I'm Allison Gothier. I teach at U32 Middle High in Montpelier, East Montpelier, Vermont, ninth grade earth science and anatomy. All right. Uh, so, uh, Maura, I had sent you um, uh, an agenda. I sent Allison and everybody an agenda, and I just, I didn't mean to co-opt it, but I did want to bring up an issue that came up uh, twice this week, and I need your, both of your opinions on, sort of on this. And I'll just set the stage by saying that uh, we had a presentation by Outright Vermont on Monday mm -hmm. to the staff that was about uh, a lot of gender identity. And we had students present about some of the things that they're hearing and feeling at school. And then on uh, Wednesday, we also had a presentation from the Montpelier High School diversity group about uh, you know, language and how they're mm -hmm. feeling at the high school and issues of race and identity uh, and how that's playing out across, you know, schools. And I'm sure it's not new, unique to our community. Um, and I then I read, and I don't know if you saw this post, but Elijah Hawks from uh, Randolph uh, High School had a really interesting post about personalized learning plans in a time of uh, divisiveness and, uh, and race. And mm -hmm. uh, I guess my question then is uh, to the panel. Hi, Lindsay, how are you? Hi, Lindsay, how are you? Good. And this is particularly, I think Lindsay is going to bring a lot to this conversation. But my question is, how do we think that personalized learning can address some of these issues of, uh, you know, microaggressions was a big word, uh, bullying is right in there, discrimination. Um, and, and you know what how does this fit in with people's I ideas of personalization and PLPs and Act 77 and I'll just open it up for discussion because uh, obviously I'm looking for ideas and feedback um, yeah I'd love to jump in I think one of the things I scanned um, I scanned the article that was titled why the PLP should be more than goals and evidence and um, it was personal learning plans for a racist and divided country was the um, name of the blog post. And in it was a particular question um, that the um, that the writer was saying that he would really like to see guiding personal learning plans. Um, and it was this. What are the most pressing problems facing our community, society or world today? And what are you going to do about it starting now? And when I read that, I was um, really struck by that because I think that's the hope that we're addressing those um, in our classrooms. And so, um, you know, I think about the role that negotiated curriculum brings into it, asking students to ask those self and world questions and trying to get them um, involved in thinking big. Um, and I think one of the challenges that was brought up was about, you know, the personal learning plan having the person be central and one of the the fears is that students are so focused on the self that they're not really um tackling social justice issues and also that um you know community service goes to just um volunteering or um sort of for personal gains and so really thinking about how are we tackling these larger um challenges within our communities and society um and how is that being captured on the personal learning plan I can okay. chime in too. I'd like to. Yep. Can I add to that? So, um, the article, um, Huffington Post article, is written by Elijah Hawks, who is an administrator at uh, Randolph. Yep. And um, so, I mean, it's a, I think it's an important article for everyone to read. But uh, for me, that social justice, the the world questions are essential and I think that the framework that I've found 
this year that has really, really helped to solidify that for the kids that I work with is using the United Nations Global Goals as a, as a launching point. So understanding what the Global Goals are all about, I mean, because these are the issues that impact both us locally and then globally, mm -hmm. and they can look to the goals to see which are the goals that are impacting their local communities or if they want to branch out bigger. Um, and then from, for us this year, their project work, they had identified the goal that they were going to be tackling through their personalized project work. So that gave our um, students a really great framework for uh, understanding these larger social justice issues and how they impact both people in their community locally and globally and what it might look like in many different forms. And it's opened up um, our projects just to some new pathways, but also I think the kids are much more knowledgeable of the issues um, beyond just their school, mm -hmm. social, individual issues. Lindsay, can I ask you a question real quick? Sure. So uh, one of the things that came up uh, in Mr. Hawk's article, there was a lot about citizenship. And as you guys may or may not know, we have, four to set, we have seven core themes in our PLP. There's identity, principles and values, community citizenship, goals, evidence, and exploration, right? And I guess my question to you, Lindsay, is do you think that an overarching idea of citizenship can encompass this idea of social justice? Because what I've talked about with my kids, citizenship is a very abstract term, and kids might not understand it or they might not get it. And it means so many different things. And we start out with being a good citizen in the classroom and treating each other kindly and with respect. And do you think that uh, under the citizenship, if that was a guiding principle or a theme of personal learning and people's PLPs, do you think that could grow out to social justice or do you think those are different things? No, I don't think they're different things at all. I think they're one and the same. I mean, when we ask kids to think about the how they can positively, positively impact their community, they're getting into, you know, what does it mean to be an active citizen in your community, whether it's school or, you know, their town or their, you know, global community. And I think understanding the role of being a citizen means that you need to have, use your voice in a way that is, um, uh, you know, respectful and responsible but also that you have a voice and that your voice matters. And I just am thinking about like even the uh, youth rally for the climate that we, you know, just attended and Don, you and your students attended. I mean, that's citizenship there. I mean, it's taking mm -hmm. part in, um, you know, a de democratic process mm -hmm. for, you know, for their future and, and, and representing themselves as members of their communities and as citizens. I think citizenship, and that's a huge component of mm -hmm. citizenship is the social justice piece. Yeah, and I, I just think that um, it's a reaffirmation that mm -hmm. um, being able to connect sort of history and social studies and community service and service learning and project-based learning can all sort of fit right into that citizenship piece and fit into personal learning, but it can also be a real way of helping kids connect with some of the issues that matter and that are impacting them. And I just wanted to take the conversation to Allison because Allison's a scientist and there were just all these marches for science. And mm -hmm. in addition to sort of all of these conversations, these thorny conversations that are happening, there's also this discussion about what's science and, you know, what should we believe and all that. And so I'm just wondering, Allison, are you dealing with citizenship on the science end at all uh, in your classes? Yes, um, no, thank you for bringing up the rally. We sent, um, I sent about three to five representatives from each of our science classes to go to the climate um, change rally that y'all are speaking of. We have never gone before. This is just the second year I think that they did it. Correct me if I'm wrong, Lindsay. Um, just to, yeah, just scope it out and they're coming back as representatives of the classes presenting about what they saw there, um, how it connects to what we did in our engineering unit here. Um, so they, so right now, I, yeah, I think them standing out as leaders 
and role mo the ro sending the role models from the class so that other people can emulate and see that, oh, I can be a citizen like just here in Montpelier by going and walking and learning about these things and bringing it back to class. Um, yeah. Okay. I, well, I just think that, you know, I don't want to, um, just going back to this conversation that uh, that's happening at our school with uh, language and microaggressions and making sure everybody feels welcome. I guess I'm just, and, you know, and, and tying that to citizenship, I'm just wondering how people are even, like what resources people are using at their schools. It, you know, uh, Lindsay mentioned the United Nations Global Goals, uh, but are there organizations around Vermont that people are tapping into? I know there's the Family Beyond Bullying. Mm -hmm. uh, and if, if anybody knows any others, please chime in or let, let me know or let our audience know because this issue seems to I can be... Speak, yeah, I can speak to that. Go ahead. Um, I think you're you're right, Don, that it's not just happening at your school. It's definitely that time of mm -hmm. year. It seems like, you know, the comfort, everyone's really comfortable, and these types of um, aggressions, microaggressions, whether online or in school, are definitely coming out. And I guess what I'm thinking about, as well as citizenship, is the identity piece. Mm -hmm. A lot of and for a lot of this is coming out because due to self-consciousness, not knowing who they themselves are as people, and then that manifesting in these different ways. Um, so I guess for me, it's a reminder of restorative practice, restorative circles, building a community and identity so that they know themselves, know their, their teammates in class, and just having that mutual respect of this common space together so that those things aren't happening. Right. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, Maura. Uh, one of the things that I was going to say that's new this year for us at our school is um, we're in our first year of a partnership with a world of difference. And so we have um, peer leaders who are trained and are going into classrooms um, and helping our students navigate some of these, um, these issues that are happening, as we're saying, in all schools and even um, just in our community as adults. I think we're facing that right now as well. And so um, that's definitely one way that we're empowering some of our students. But I think, you know, in general, we really, um, there's a lot of work to be done. Um, and I think this has been a year of, um, you know, many challenges that are being brought into schools and trying to figure out at the middle level, especially how are we helping students to navigate these changes and, um, you know, become good citizens and tackle social justice issues and know sort of where they stand. And so, um, I think the more resources and the more sharing is going to be very helpful. Yeah, and um, I appreciate everybody's input, and I just want to encourage you if you could send um, if you could send uh, some resources to me so that we can post them. That would be great. And I we kind of have a full agenda, and I'm can sure. I say one um, yeah. That? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Of mine. I'm like trying to get a word, but. Well, I mean, that's, uh, you know, this is like the school climate and the mm -hmm. um, diversity piece uh, is a real passion of mine. So just like more, we have the, um, we have peer leaders. We've had mm -hmm. a program for the past four years, four or five years. And uh, it's the Anti-Defamation League's A World of Difference. It's an amazing program. But I also was just going to say there, um, MTV has this, um, uh, campaign called uh, Look Different, and it has these little videos on microaggressions that are really mm -hmm. great just as like discussion topics. And then um, I was going to say the other piece is using um, young, uh, you know, young adult literature to really yep. address a lot of this. And that's really where I find the most uh, meaningful conversations and discussions and learning is when we are using text and hearing people's stories and narratives. So, Lindsay, can I ask you some, uh, a, a big favor? Do you think that you could do a blog just uh, you know, outlining maybe a bulleted list with some of these resources and links? And sure. then um, that would be really, really helpful because I'm, uh, you know, based on that Hawks Huffington blog post, I think that's mm -hmm. a start. But I think teachers are looking for, well, wait a minute, this is happening now. What are some pre-existing right. um, materials that can really – be brought into my classroom that we can discuss. And in particular, if you could, you know, just an outline, I think that would be really important for folks this year. And I think also what you just said about young adult literature, mm -hmm. you know, I'm finding 
with personal learning, the more I get into it, the more I realize how you have to have the basics down. Uh, you have to have good text. You have to have the skills to understand that text. And I think this mm -hmm. is an example of how personalized learning actually uh, has made me even focus harder on the fundamentals um, with kids. And if, if you could get those resources to me, that's why, uh, you know, I know you're an expert on that and anything you can provide would be outstanding. I certainly can. Okay. Um, I think, can I, oh, sorry. Go, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I think, I think one of the hopes is too, that we're capturing this work. Cause I think, you know, from what we're all saying is that there are things that are happening within schools and the ball is starting to roll. And so I think, you know, in thinking about you have it set up so nicely where you have citizenship as an element, a standalone part of your PLP, but thinking about how are we capturing this work? And I think the PLP is a really great way. So if a student is a peer leader, that they're reflecting after they teach a class and then that's going right on the PLP. And so we're, we're being really intentional with students about capturing and tracking and creating the um, times to pause and reflect mm -hmm. when events come up or when they're doing something or they're going out but they're capturing that evidence and they're reflecting and we're really saying like, this is really meaningful, this is really important and it has a place and creating that space digitally through a, the PLP I think is is vital because um, it, it brings just more authenticity to the things that the kids are doing. And the uh, presentation from the uh, high school diversity group was run by students and um, you know afterwards I'm like wow I, you know I had no idea that you were experiencing or feeling this way but I was also asking them I'm like are you capturing this because mm -hmm. this is real leadership and they had presented to our staff and they had presented to the staff at the high school so you're absolutely right the reflection the writing the presenting to me those are all the proficiencies that we're asking kids to demonstrate mm -hmm. and they're addressing real world problems and I think it's critical and I also just wonder how much of this is tied to the current political climate mm -hmm. and, um, you know, these conversations that you're hearing. It, it, in some ways, it's coming right from the top. And how are we going to help children deal with this and think about it and, um, you know, and, and be able to keep marching forward in a positive way? Uh, the next thing, I'm actually going to skip down a little bit. And Maura, I was wondering, uh, we talked a little bit about collaboration just now. And I was wondering, you have this collaboration going on mm -hmm. where you, with another middle school. And I was wondering if you could talk about that and how that might be another way of getting kids understanding different communities and creating relationships with other schools. Yeah, I'd love to. So um, a few, probably in February, we were approached um, by some teachers at Stowe Middle School who are in our supervisory union. And we... Um, the Lamoille South Supervisory Union, we do a lot of work as a full um, supervisory union with our um, professional development and we have curriculum camps and so um, and some in services throughout the year where we collaborate with teachers. And so it came up through um, some conversations at Stowe Middle School because we have so many common goals and we're implementing Act 77 in similar ways across the district. That would be really great to get our students with um, Stowe Middle School students. Um, to talk amongst themselves about um, the PLP, about their experiences go to, going to school, but the hopes that um, students would then help with sort of a redesign process and having schools collaborating between both middle schools um, will make sure that we're, you know, uh, packaging the same message. And it's also um, having an understanding from the other teachers, like we'll be able to collaborate a little bit more on the stuff that we're doing within the class. Um, and with the PLP. And then the hope is also that the students would continue a partnership over multiple years. So they would work as um, like goals partners and giving feedback digitally and also um, physically meeting. And so thinking about how we can um, have our students collaborating more um, that way. And so last, oh, sorry, this week, it's been a long week, this week on Tuesday, um, we took our students, two students from each grade and each team at PA to Stowe Middle School for the afternoon. And um, this was sort of the get to know you, like we did a lot of cooperative games. Um, we had them go through a process of talking about their um, goals and their portfolio and their academic work and talk about what's working well and things they'd like to change um, as a way to sort of 
set them up for our next meeting, which is happening in um, the beginning of June, to start thinking about the redesign process. What would they like to see? Um, what were things that they liked at the previous school? And it was so wonderful seeing students from two different schools. And you know, even though we're the same supervisor union, I think the culture and the demographic is pretty different between our two schools. And um, conversations that students were having and showing each other the work, the schoolwork that they're doing and the conversations that kids had. Um, I was commenting to our principal, I drove students there and I wish that I had captured the conversation in the car on the way home. Um, <laughs> the students were talking about, you know, how much, um, you know, it kind of empowered them, the work that they were doing. They felt so good about their portfolios and they even said one of them was walking back into school and she was like, I think I like our school even more now. And it wasn't because it was like, you know, this is better than this. It just was getting to see something else. And no, they were like, it just feels like I'm coming home walking back into school. And so giving That's students those experiences of going out and seeing different places and talking about learning and goals and PLPs um, was a really nice way to um, start the collaboration process between the schools. That's awesome. That's awesome. And is, uh, is anybody else doing any of that type of collaboration? Lindsay or Allison? Um, we've certainly done collaboration with, uh, we, last year we collaborated with Hazen, uh, Hazen Union, um, when they were starting their negotiated curriculum process. And so our students would do Google Hangouts with one another and share um, kind of strategies and, and our, you know, because our students had done it before, they talked the Hazen Union students kind of through the process. Um, and we've done other hangouts and can, pieces like that. Um, but I really I, I'm happy to hear about the Peoples and Stowe collaboration on a like it's a larger system mm -hmm. piece instead of just like a team collaborating with, you know, um, another team or a school. Right. And Allison, uh, are you, well, I mean, I don't, why aren't we collaborating, right? I mean, that makes, doesn't make any sense. Is, are you guys doing, I mean, have you reached out to any schools like ours? So the, yeah, the partnership I could point to the most is a large number of our high school um, incoming sophomore, junior, or senior students go to Barry Technical Center. Right. Um, and that seems like a really untapped partnership. And in the next couple of years, we're going to really have to partner with them to navigate proficiency-based learning mm -hmm. because they're receiving, it's kind of like this, I don't know what they're going to do, but they're receiving all of these students from different schools that all have a very different personalized learning plan as well as proficiencies. How they're going to navigate that, mm -hmm. it would just point towards a partnership that needs to happen in the next three years or so. So I, that, that's really interesting that you brought that up because um, my our vacation is different than Chittenden County. So I live yeah. in Chittenden County and work in Washington. And... Uh, <laughs> um, last week, I got the chance to go to the Center for Technology in Essex, and I got to uh, look at a classroom in there that's doing computer-aided design and drafting, and that experience was unbelievable to me, and why all kids aren't having the opportunity to see what's happening in these mm -hmm. uh, tech centers. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and they've been saying this for a long time. And until you go over there and see what's happening with these kids and how independent they are and how driven and the level of technology that they're using mm -hmm. is, is just out of this world. And I think that that's going to be really imperative for all of us is to, as professionals, we should be going to these tech centers and seeing what they have to offer. Um, because they are, I mean, it is unbelievable. And you, I went to a class, uh, Jim Dermeyer at Essex, and he has it all sketched out. This is what you need to take. This is what I offer. He also is a um, certified dual enrollment instructor, so kids could take college classes right mm -hmm. there. And then he points kids, or at least shows them, you know, if you pass these two classes, here's where you can be going to uh, CCV. Here's where you can be going to mm -hmm. Vermont Tech. Here's where you can be going to Norwich or RPI or MIT. And it really, mm -hmm. if you look at what's happening out there with student debt and kids not mm -hmm. finishing school, it was really very interesting. And I would encourage uh, Allison and, you know, Lindsay, I'm sure you've already been over to the Tech Center. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sure you have some thoughts on that. Uh, 
but it was really incredible. And then I guess, Maura, one question I have for you is where do your kids go for tech? Um, so our kids go to the Green Mountain Technical Center, which is right, it's literally two miles away. Um, it's connected to the Lamoille Union um, High School. And we take all of our eighth graders there um, in the fall. And we do a full day, um, like going in, visiting classes. They have activities set up for us. A lot of times we have um, PA students who are facilitating the activities for us while we're there. Um, and it's just such, such a wonderful opportunity. Um, and, you know, I think it brings up also teachers um, needing, middle school teachers really needing to be aware of the flexible pathways and the opportunities for students once they're in high school, because we need to start having those conversations with students now. Um, about, you know, these are some opportunities you could have in high school, or this is what dual enrollment will look like. Um, if you take these online high school classes as an eighth grader, then maybe when you're a junior in high school, like really starting to think forward with kids. Um, I know we take our eighth graders to um, uh, the Vermont Community College, and they do a whole day around dual enrollment while they're there, and that really um, sparks their interest in thinking about post-secondary opportunities. But I think no, I think you're right. I think as middle school teachers, we need to really start having the conversation in seventh and eighth grade. And I think, you know, when we think about the My Future area or the transition areas in the PLP, this is where we need to start planning forward with kids and saying, okay, so what are your goals? Where would you like to go? Um, are there online classes that you want to take? Are there certifications that you want to look into? Um, what about in high school? Is there a particular class or going to the tech center? You know, I think we need to start planning ahead with kids um, because I think, you know, we have a lot of the information um, and the high school has a lot of the information, but this is brand new to parents too. And so parents are going to need to know, um, need us as allies to help navigate these changes as well. So I think it's crucial that we start thinking forward a little bit with our students. And, and um, I think, as Lindsay, I say, historically, the, um, the tech centers have had like a, um, stigma or stereotype mm -hmm. about what kind of programs they offer and um, I think that that you know we need to also um, to connect to what more just said about the parents like help them understand that our tech centers are really really different than yeah. when we were in high school mm -hmm. um, I mean when they were when I was in high school it was awesome too but the programs that they offered have just exploded and it's mm -hmm. amazing. And then the opportunity is beyond like having, taking um, college courses and I mean, it's just, you know, I don't think we have to do our part in informing parents. I absolutely agree. Yeah. It's way. almost, it's almost as if it's doing a disservice to uh, the tech centers to call them a tech center because they should be called yeah. technology centers because the right. technology that I was seeing was unbelievable where kids were using, you know, three dimensional drafting and uh, uh, it was just incredible. You know, they were doing these pull out pictures of engineering projects and mm -hmm. I mean, the jobs were right there, what these kids are, right. are heading into. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I mean, I was looking at it saying, here's how you change your socioeconomic status. You get, you get certified. It's right here. You go to college here in Vermont, and then you get a job. The unemployment rate is so low, and people need these types of technology jobs. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe that's something that we should be pushing to through the flexible pathways is, you know, getting our kids out there and seeing what what it really looks like and mm -hmm. what skills you need to have in order to, uh, you know, be a viable have that be a viable option. So I just wanted to bring that up because I had not really had the opportunity to visit a tech center, and it was well worth it. And I encourage you guys, um, you know, it sounds like everybody's up and running, but to spread the word on that. Um, the last kind of thing I want to talk about is uh, sort of a round table. What are people doing as we head towards the end of the year? How are you getting your kids ready for the next life and learning stage or that transformation from seventh to eighth grade or eighth grade to high school or high school and beyond? Uh, what are you doing? How's it going? And what are you hoping to achieve by the end of the year? I can, um, I can talk about that a little bit. Um, so we are, um, 
I've been working very closely with the high school staff. So we're in one, well, we're two schools within sort of one building. And so um, what we've been doing is we've been meeting with one of the high school guidance counselors weekly um, since before um, break, so probably around March. And um, we have been talking about, you know, making TA placements. We've done step up uh, days where we've done classroom observations. They've come in and talked to our students. Um, also, we're going to do a full step up day where they're going to go to their new TAs and do tours of the school. And so that's sort of one of the things that we've been doing. We've also invited high school teachers and administrators to come and um, join us um, at our portfolio showcase that we had a few weeks ago. And so they started having conversation with, with students about um, their PLPs. And then um, on that TA step up day, when they go to meet with their TAs, one of the things we're expecting them to do is to talk about their portfolios and showcase that. Um, and so um, that's sort of where we're at for transitioning our eighth graders to high school. Awesome, Lindsay. So um, next week, our team, we go on a, an annual three-day trip to Holbert Outdoor Center, always the first week in May um, for a community building experience. And I would highly recommend Holbert Outdoor Center in Fairleigh, Vermont. It's incredible. Um, so we'll be doing that. And then we've basically, right, I'm on April break, so as you can tell. Um, so we, uh, right before break, we set out um, a timeline with each week um, until the end of the year or until our project fair being June 14th. So the kids had to map out, you know, what is their kind of micro goals for each week for their project work um, from before break until project fair. And they, you know, kids are really cranking on their personalized project work. And we had peek through the window which is our kind of our midway check-in. And so they got a lot of good feedback during that time. Um, so now they're just really starting to do all the final pieces of their projects. And um, so when we get back, we have, when we get back from our trip, we have SBACs, which will eat up quite a bit of time. And, but in, um, when we're not doing the SBACs and science kneecaps, we will be um, really, diving into the projects. All right, and uh, Allison? Yes, um, as you all know, a big goal for this year has been integrating proficiency-based learning into, and how that works with flexible pathways and PLPs. A lot of students right now are re-performing um, between now and the end of the year, and particularly in science and math, we're trying to um, incorporate a large project at the end where students will be able to re-perform on any standards we have hit and make this synthesized product at the end. Ultimately, um, you know, time is the variable and here's more time to, if you're at proficient, move to advanced or get to that proficient um, stage before moving on to sophomore year. For next year, they're also in teams. Um, so we had ninth grade teams this year and sophomore um, teams next year to provide that wraparound support um, for them. So that's where we're at in terms of closing out the year, starting to. Awesome. Uh, where are we? We have, we're doing a green team expo uh, next uh, week where we are um, having kids from uh, kids have invited presenters from the community uh, to um, present different elements of uh, sustainability and efficiency so we have somebody who's coming to talk about bumblebees we have someone coming to talk about solar projects uh, talking about water conditions and all the kids in the school are going to go to two workshops so our kids are organizing that they're also creating PSAs, and we're going to have a film contest next week to vote for the best PSAs. And then I've taken uh, Lindsay Holman's, Holman's uh, I've taken her student negotiated curriculum, and we're doing student negotiated projects. And that's sort of interesting. That's been a lot of work that I have to talk to Lindsay about in depth. Um, <laughs> but kids are really, they've kind of, we had to do a whole process through that. And uh, it's been really interesting and it's been a ton of learning on my part and figuring out how to structure it so that the, so that the um, 
so that it works really. And it's really required a lot of thought and Lindsay, your work has been really important for what I've been doing. And I appreciate all the mm -hmm. hard work you've done ahead of time. Um, then the, uh, so we're, all these things are happening in conjunction. We have the SBACs and then we're also moving to a uh, performance of learning um, where students are going to, rather than just giving sort of speeches at the end of the year, they're also going to present their learning and their findings. Uh, through their PLP or through their artifacts and that's the first time we've done that so that should be fairly interesting and uh, I'm just continuing to think about uh, flexible pathways this idea of equity is keeps coming up this idea of equity and also respect for others and diversity and how we're going to continue um, teaching and learning about that with kids uh, so there's just a lot going on, and I think every how many people feel busy? Raise oh my gosh! You, right, right. Um, John, quick question for you. Yeah. For the presentation, um, who's the audience going to be? Just curious. Well, it's going to be on graduation, the evening of graduation, and rather than just have the family show up to the sort of the ceremony or whatever, we're going to have uh, like a half hour or 45 minutes before that, we're going to invite the families to come in and talk to the teachers and look at the work that the kids have been doing. Uh, it'll sort of be an extended sort of conference, but it also allow the kids to kind of walk through and showcase and see the other portfolios of, um, of their classmates on all the teams in the school. So mm -hmm. that should be, um, we'll, we'll see, we haven't done that before. Um, and we'll just kind of see how that goes. And the other thing I just want to mention too, before we, before we sign off, uh, we have uh, the Middle Grades Institute, which mm -hmm. is June 26th through June 30th. Uh, I think everybody here is involved with that, which will be yep. great. Uh, also, the Power 2 conference is next Tuesday, I believe. It's uh, May 2nd, I think. That's happening. Um, and then also, I just wanted to sh give a shout out to the Vermont NEA. I don't know if you guys have been thinking about the Vermont NEA as a professional development resource. But uh, Julie Longchamp at the Vermont NEA is really pushing uh, to support teachers and to provide them with really good professional development. So uh, August 1st through the 3rd, there's a Vermont NEA uh, leadership conference, which is going to have uh, some personalization work. It's also going to have work on national board certification. So those are things that are out there on, uh, on the professional development calendar. Does anybody know of other events that are happening or that you want to highlight? Not that I can think of right now. Well, this is a follow-up. May 12th, um, in the beginning of the year in September, um, I was involved in the planning of um, a day called Cultivating Pathways to Sustainability, and a number of middle and high school teams came to Shelburne Farms to develop uh, projects around the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and we are having a um, follow-up day at Peoples uh, on May 12th um, to, for the students to share uh, out their work with mm -hmm. the other um, students that are there. So this is a follow-up and then year two will be, you know, hopefully year two will be announced as well soon. But these have been, there have been some really phenomenal projects. Um, across the state and I'm looking forward to hearing what people have done. Hey, Lindsay, can you do me a favor on that? Can you, sure. as soon as you learn the dates of next year, I don't know mm -hmm. if they're taking new members or new participants. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, as soon as you get those dates, can you get those out? Because um, those, I, if I could have those dates way, way ahead of time, that would be awesome. Sure. Okay, uh, any last thoughts uh, before we close up? All right, well, I apologize for a little bit of the technical difficulties. I'll try and get those squared away. Um, check out the blog. Uh, Maura just had a great uh, new blog post, and we're starting to get more and more uh, mm -hmm. input on that. And if you know anybody who'd be interested in blogging or if you have links of people who you think uh, we can sort of uh, distribute or talk about, uh, please let me know. And until next time, I hope everybody has a, a great day and a great weekend. And Lindsay, I hope you have a great end of your vacation. <laughs> and uh, we'll see you. We'll see everybody soon. Thank you very much, everybody.